How many of you have read Harry Potter before? <laughs> Usually I can count. Uh, I'm giving myself 80 minutes for this book and then 80 minutes for the next one. That should be the right count. Um, that's usually the case. Almost everybody your age has read the Harry Potter novels, and usually, you know, it ranges from one to class this size. Maybe five people have read um, Lord of the Rings. Probably because many of you probably picked this up, had it given to you, etc., when you were about 11 or 12. Maybe a little bit earlier, and you just, you know, read them right along. Um, my kids were of, the, were of the age that they weren't necessarily 11 or 12 in 97. Um, 97, when the first books were published, they were quite a bit younger than that. But they read them, you know, as soon as each book came out. When I've taught in London, usually uh, in the past, it's been the case that most of those students read it when it first came out, beginning around 97, 98, 2000, and they were right around 10, 11, 12 at that period. And so their whole development from late childhood to mid to late adolescence coincided with Harry, okay? Which, you know, can lead into some, some interesting discussions. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the background, but I have to spend a little bit. How many of you know how the, how it, how the idea came to her? How it happened? Go ahead. Wasn't she on her way to her job on the train and she was just sitting and looking at the window and the bridge was carrying Close. Her Close. She was on a train from Manchester to London. She didn't have a job. Um, and at one point, she was a unemployed, unwed mother living on welfare, Scottish welfare, um, without any prospects, really. In another moment, she was still unemployed, unwed, without any prospects, but she had an idea. And the idea that popped into her mind, literally popped into her mind, came out of nowhere, was a boy discovers on his 11th birthday that he's a wizard and the greatest dark wizard who ever lived is after him. He wants to kill him. And she's like, what? Where did this come from? What I want to know is, why her and not me? <laughs> why didn't that idea pop into my mind? Because she goes from being unemployed, broke, to, this is in around um, 91, 92, when this happens to her, to, well, let's say 10 years later, in 2000. She is a multimillionaire. By the time this book gets published, she's the richest woman in the United Kingdom, wealthier than Queen Elizabeth, and one of the richest people in the world. Why? Because this idea popped into her head. That's simply it. Okay? It jumps every time. Because where does that kind of spark come from? It didn't come from inside her. She wasn't sitting there going, come on, think, idea for a book. I know I've got it in me. Nope. She had written stories since childhood, bad stories. Okay. If you ever tried to read A Casual Vacancy, which was her first foray into adult novels, don't. It's <laughs> horrible. Because, I mean, she tries to be all literary, Englishy, professory, and go into theory and all this other nonsense. Read her detective fiction under the nickname, under the pen name, uh, Robert Goldthwait, something like that. Cormor and Strike novels. Cormor and Strike is the name of the, tech, of the detective. And I'm not a huge detective fiction fan, but they are out of this world good. Plots, extremely complex, and the writing is superb. Now, if you are a Harry Potter lover and you worship at the altar of J.K. Rowling, sorry, but I'm going to pop your god a bit because <laughs> her writing in these is not that good and there are a lot of flaws. 
But by the time this book comes around, especially, I think her copy editors have been told by the CEO of Bloomsbury Publishing, which is the English publisher, and by Arthur A. Levine, the American publisher, don't touch a word. Why? Every word. By the time Goblet of Fire comes out, every word is dollar bills or pounds. Okay? If you know anything about the publishing history, when this one gets published, it's a very small print run. She went through, I've seen varying estimates, anywhere between 17 and 25 or 26 rejections for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Finally, an acquisitions editor at Bloomsbury said, we'll take a shot. And I think it had an initial print run. It was really small, of like 4,500 copies. No advertising. I mean, not even advertising in you know, a magazine or whatever. Just none. They weren't going to spend anything. They, they printed it. They sold it. It went out to some bookstores. People started to buy it because... You know, it looked interesting. They bought it for their kids. Kids ate it up, loaned it to their friends, begged mom and dad to buy a copy for them. Mom and dad bought a copy. Initial print run sold out. They did a larger second print run. So if you have a first print run, first edition, it's worth tens of thousands of dollars. Okay? I mean, it's hugely expensive. Okay? So that one, all sold by word of mouth. Okay? This one came out. You already have a built-in fan base of sorts. It's still not huge, okay? But it gets um, published, larger initial print run, because the earlier one, you know, did so well. I first learned about it in January of 99. I was at Sam's Club buying groceries, and there are these two books with the new hardcover hardcover, Harry Potter and um, Prisoner of Azkaban. And I was driving into work one day, this is back when I listened to NPR, I was driving into work one day and they had on the, um, the NPR uh, London bureau chief, a guy named T.K. Reed, who I kind of like most of his stuff. Well, he talked about, you know, there's this new fantasy children's author. And he compared J.K. Rowling with C.S. Lewis. And I taught a course on the Inklings, edited a journal about Lewis and Tolkien and, and that group for several years. And so, I mean, became an English professor because of Lewis. And so, you know, he mentioned Lewis and my antennae went up. And then he said, she's not like that stodgy old allegorical, you know, Bible thumping C.S. Lewis. And I just, you know, immediately tuned him out and thought, well, I'm not going to read that crap <coughs> based on that review. Later on, that was like in January, March or so, I was at Sam's, saw these, remembered the interview, and thought, hmm, picked up Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Sorcerer's Stone, American edition, we'll talk about the change in titles in a moment, and read the first paragraph and was hooked. Because of that little sly, sly subtle British humor, you know, thank you very much at the end. I mean, it just... And I sat, stood there and read like the first chapter. Bought that one. Literally went home, read it, went back the next day, next day got Chamber of Secrets and Prisoner of Azkaban. And started teaching them, I think, that fall. Even though, I, you know, series was incomplete, right? So, one, two, three, four. Four books in a row. Boom, 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 boom. Why? Well, she'd been working on these since 91. I mean, she essentially had... Most of these already finished by this period. Bear in mind what we learned about her from interviews and such in the early 2000s, very late 1990s, was she had a file box of notes for each volume before this one was published. She already had a volume of notes and drafts and things for Harry Potter and the Deathly Hounds. She didn't have the title yet, but she kind of had a general idea of where it was going. Well, what began happening once it hit the airwaves in the United States? What began happening in schools? Book banning. Book banning. 
Okay, we started to see various groups coming out wanting to ban ban the books for a variety of reasons: witches, wizards, goes against the Old Testament law, etc. Okay, spells. I I, I read something uh, a week no about two or three weeks. In fact, I meant to forward it to you guys. Um, St. Edward's Catholic School in Nashville banned the books because the person in charge, can't remember what his title is, said they teach actual spells that invoke diabolic forces. Well, it's clear. I'm, I am a conservative Christian, started an Orthodox, like Greek Orthodox church here in town. Okay, So, I mean, I believe Christianity to lock, stock, and barrel. That is nonsense, what that guy said. He didn't read the books. Why? Read the books, look at the spells, and every one of the spells. Any of you take any Latin in high school? They're all what? Bad Latin. That's what they all are. Okay? But French is bad Latin. Spanish is bad Latin. <laughs> Italian is bad Latin. That's from my Latin classics professor when I was working on my PhD. Okay? So you started to see that. So, well, what happens when you make a big media outcry, outpouring, big fuss about banning something? <laughs> Sales go up, interest goes up, etc. So she starts, you know, getting on TV interviews, all this kind of stuff. Well, in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002, I think it was, a reporter for the Vancouver Sun interviewed her and they talked about you know your books are being banned they're being charged with being heretical being blasphemous leading children into the occult and to become Satan worshippers and the whole nine yards and in the interviewer just boldly said are you a Christian and she said yes I am you know probably caught the interviewer off guard there well what kind, you know? Like, what's your flavor of the month? What flavor Christian are you? I mean, there's 22,000 Protestant denominations. Which one are you if you're Protestant? She said, I belong to the Church of Scotland, Presbyterian, okay? She didn't say, I attend every Sunday, and I swear by the Westminster Confession of Faith, and blah, 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 and John Knox is my God, you know? She didn't do that. She just said, you know, I hear blah, blah, okay? He said, or she said, the interview was, was a woman, said, okay, well, how does that inform your work? How does your Christian belief inform your work? Enrolling, I think she's a born actor, kind of gave this dramatic pause and said, well, if I were to answer that, it would give away the end. In other words, by saying, if I were to answer that, it would give away the end. She is saying that as of 2001 or so, and as of at that time how she thought of the end, somehow Christian ideology would find its way in. Okay? And if you've read the works and you've read them carefully, and especially if you've compared them with the film versions, the books are very different from the films. And I don't just mean, you know, what gets cut and what gets added, that kind of thing. I mean the story arc. Why? Because there's something at the beginning of the seventh book and at the end of the seventh book that are left out of the seventh and eighth films. They might be on the extended DVD release. I don't know, because I've never watched them. <laughs> I refuse to. I've had plenty of people tell me what's in and what the, these two scenes are not in, okay? Well, you take those two scenes out, two scenes from book seven, one at the beginning and one at the end, and it dramatically changes the arc from the first book to the end of the last book, okay? And I don't know why they changed that, why they took that out. So... You have these four, boom, 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 right in a row. And if you remember, you guys probably know, you wouldn't have been over. <laughs> Huge weight. I mean, this one was the first Harry Potter book release where there were Harry Potter book release parties. Barnes and Noble, 
was open till midnight. Books a Million was open till midnight. Okay, This was the first one with Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Amazon was still pretty new by then. That you could order the book ahead of time. With this book in 2000, I think it was, there were 7 million or so advance sales. That is, 7 million copies had been bought before anybody could put their hands on the book. It was mind-blowing at the time. Okay. Also, at this time, in 2000, when Harry Potter and Goblet of Fire came out, the top four books on the New York Times bestseller list of books were <laughs> in that order. In 2007, when Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows came out, they were in the top ten. I take that back. Take that back. 2003, with Order of the Phoenix, they were in the top five. Between 2003 and 2005, the New York Times changed their policy for their bestseller list. It would no longer include children's literature. Because they knew when this came out, it would be number one. And every time a new book came out, it broke sales records. Okay. In the, what is it now, uh, 22 years? 22 years since this book came out, these have sold over 500 million copies. Tolkien, since 1954, has sold over about 350, 400 million copies. The only other book in history that is book, if you think of all seven as being kind of one book in terms of its series, that has sold more is the Bible. Okay? Which is why, beginning about 98, 99, you started to see all kinds of articles about how J.K. Rowling has resurrected reading for young people. Okay? Because youngsters, children, were reading these books and wanted to read more like them. So you had the R.L. Stein Goosebumps, or whatever they were called, books come out. You had the Magic Treehouse books. Heard she was first. She just, she created that audience, okay? And you get a lot of knockoff kind of, you know, kind of stuff too, okay? So, a couple, uh, let's see, anything else about all? So it starts with this idea, okay? She gets it published, it takes off gradually, and then she becomes hugely famous. Now, are any of you, do any of you follow or involved or do, I, I don't know, you know the terminology, Pottermore? You get out, you've been sorted, and you've gone, and you've read all the stuff. You follow. How many of you follow her on Twitter? Okay. Here is where I'm going to step on thin ice. <laughs> For how many of you does what she say on Twitter or Pottermore increase? your appreciation for the books as they are written. I think it, no. like whenever Pottermore first came out, that was one of the rough pieces because she keeps changing her She's the internal channel. Channel. Okay, see, I've not been on Pottermore for years, literally. She keeps, you said, you use an interesting verb there. She keeps changing. What does she keep changing? And she just adds more than anything. She adds, what else? Little tiny details about Little tiny details about characters. Is it adding or is it changing? I mean, it's adding. I mean, it's adding. It's not explicitly stated in the book. I mean, I've never seen anything specifically where it's like, this is what she said on Twitter has been disproved by what she's written in the book. Okay. Because I know the big thing went on with Dumbledore when she said that Dumbledore was actually gay. When she added him. Wait, who said, to, who said he's not? She did. She went back and said that he was Oh, did she? Yeah. I'm not familiar with that. Um, okay. The reason the reason I brought this up is I'm how to put this. No, I, I, I don't mean I don't mean because I'm you know worried I'll offend somebody. I'm, I'm trying to think how to construct this. Um, 
what is the Harry Potter world? Is it these? Or let me let me put this let me put it this way. For me, this is Harry Potter, and not anything she has said since then. Why? Traditionally, if an author wants to add material, what does an author do? They revise it. They revise it. Tolkien revised The Hobbit. There is a revised Hobbit. In the revised Hobbit, the, the riddle game that Bilbo and Gollum play is different than in the first edition of it. It's very different in terms of some of the riddles that are played. Okay, um, There are other authors who, who famously revise and revise and revise. Yeah, Judah. Are you asking what the canon for Harry Potter should be, essentially? Kind of. Because she adds all this extra stuff but does that really help you better understand these? See, I guess part of what I'm getting at is traditionally what an, what an author does, and I don't mean traditionally in, you know, in the quote-unquote conservative sense. I just mean historically, from when people began writing books up to really J.K. Rowling and, and Pottermore. What an author did was he or she wrote the stuff and said, there it is. <laughs> There it goes. <laughs> now you do with it what you can. And the author stood back and said, I've said my say. Now, if I've said my say well, <laughs> you get to interact with it. Not interact like we think modern day technology interact, but you interact and you do what with it? Interpret it. You interpret it. Because we all interpret, you know, we've talked about this before. We all interpret things a little bit differently. Hopefully, we're all going to be on the same page about, you know, how old is Harry in the first book? Because if somebody says Harry's 15 and is willing to die on that hill, they're stupid. Because <laughs> Harry's 11 and he's only going to be 11. He's 10 at the very beginning, but he turns, you know, that kind of thing, okay? It seems to me what she's trying to do, and I could be wrong here, but I don't think so. She's trying to control everything about the books. Now, J.R.R. Tolkien said, and you don't have to take Tolkien's word for it, but I think he's right. J.R.R. Tolkien said, that's why he disliked allegory. Because an allegory, a writer is telling you, this is what the story means, or this is only what the story means, and you cannot interpret it any other way. You are not free to interpret it in any way. I, as author, am God to you. Period. Whereas Tolkien said, here's Lord of the Rings. I like it. <laughs> I really like this kind of story. It's long, it's got all kinds of stuff going on, it moves me, blah, 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 blah. Let's see if it does you, okay? But she keeps tinkering. And if she really wants to do that, what should she do? Because guess what? If she revises these, I've probably got five complete copies. I've got one whole British set. Actually, I've got about one and a half British sets now. Guess who will be the first damn stupid person to you know, be in line to buy a revised edition? I will, because you know what I would do? I would go through page by page to see how it's different. How has she revised this? How has she, has she brought in some of the backstory of characters that's brought out in the Pottermore stuff? Okay. Um, ranch over. It's on June. It's kind of almost like a rogue applicability where she like left it to applicability, but then she like almost doesn't like it. So now she has to make an allegory, but then because she keeps like because it's a progressive revelation of what she means by it, it's like all of us are over here like, well, I thought it meant that, but you know, 
It could be wrong depending on what the Twitter account says tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so by renunciation of power, are you saying she is power hungry? Um. <laughs> I'll I've never thought about it in connection with the theme of the class. <laughs> well, I, I think to an extent she is, I mean, it's her child. Yeah. yeah. She her wants to control it. Her child's like 22 now. But. Well, <laughs> this yeah. is her creation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's her creation. She wants to control it. That's exactly why I like. I, am, I understand that it's a little extra, but I'm like, I mean, it's her story. Just let her do what she wants to do with her story. Like, yeah. <laughs> but it's your childhood. And, you and don't it's, have to read any of the content that she puts out. There. Exactly, which is why I, I, I don't. So. <laughs> um, she created it, but it's, it's not any longer hers. How so? Hamlet's not Shakespeare. And I know Hamlet and Shakespeare are 400 years old. Bilbo is not Tolkien's. Why? It's the readers. Because he put it out there for us. She put it out there for us. <coughs> she said, I think this is good. And it's all, again, my impression. I'm not saying you have to accept this. It's I think this is good, and here's why you think it's good, and here's why I think it's good, and you should think the way I think. In terms of, here's a character that's in here, and then we get all this other information on Pottermore and stuff, and does that other information on Pottermore help to explain the character's motivation in here? For example, Dumbledore's being gay. Is that relevant anywhere in the books? Even book seven where we find about Dumbledore's friendship with Grindelwald. Is there anything in Book 7 that indicates it's a sexual friendship? Nope. Not at all. Okay? So why did she do it? That's the interesting question. Because a lot of people have said she's trying to get, you know, her... Points. Yeah, her points. Her progressive... Um, Bona fides, her, her good qualities, you know, virtue signaling of a sort, okay? I saw, you had a hand up. Yeah, I know no one asked me, but if you ask me. I'm asking you, go ahead. <laughs> I've used 18 in my 80 minutes, go ahead. I think that um, sort of adding stuff like that and changing things, and I know an argument could be made for either one, but even a revision I think would be strictly detrimental to the overall books because I've, I've read plenty of things this included where a character interaction or an ending or so, anything at all could just is left open a little bit and so there's that room for interpretation and when you read it you have your own experience and I think that's a strictly positive aspect to have in a book so when you go back and change it to more to be more suited to a political climate for instance or for any other reason at all I just think it's worse. Yeah, that's kind of, that's partly what C.S. Lewis, I think I mentioned this book in here, what C.S. Lewis mentioned in his little book, An Experiment in Criticism, which is largely about two things. What's a good book and what's a good reader? And he says what a, a good book is a book that you go back to and reread. You probably have college textbooks. You're not going to go back and reread. You might sell them very quickly upon the end of the semester. I'm thinking like biology textbooks, unless you're going to be, you know, in the medical, whatever, okay? But um, many of you have alluded to that you've read these several times, okay? Why do you read it several times? You already know what happens. You pull stuff out each time. Yeah. Bingo. Because it's like an onion. You peel the layer away, oh, there's another layer in within. As Lewis puts it kind of, you know, in the Chronicles of Narnia about Narnia, the farther in you go, the more you discover, kind of a thing. Yeah, Judah. Well, specifically with the Alice Dumbledore being gay thing, when I, I, my house didn't have Harry Potter when I was young. We weren't like a member of the band community, right. but my parents were kind of like, there's controversy, we'll just steer clear. When I was in seventh grade, my friend Caleb smuggled me a copy, <laughs> and, um, and I read it, but 
I read the whole books after having had like six years with my friends for all like Dumbledore's game, you know Dumbledore's gay. And then I read the books, and at the end I came back and asked them, I said, why do you think Dumbledore's gay? And they were like, oh, J.K. Rowling said it. I said, well, that's weird because there's nothing in the books that suggests that. And it almost makes it a little challenging to read it because even if, even when I was reading it like, oh, he's gay, it's like, why, that's, there's no information here that actually says that. It could or could not be true, but it's not pertinent information to anything. Well, no, and with that is, because um, I was I was so excited when she came out and said that. I was like 100% for it and happy about it. But like, it didn't do anything with the story. And one could even say that it's kind of insulting that she would just throw him in there as gay just to get her points in with the LGBT community. Because um, she also did it, I can't remember, um, I read that in an interview once she said that Dean and Seamus might have been gay, but she didn't want to do it because it would distract from the story. Yeah, and there was something just in the last three or four months, and I, it, it's just totally off my off the top of my head. Um, can't remember what it was. But it was something that got the LGBTQ community really riled. I mean, they were attacking her on Twitter because of it. That she was like, you know, adding it in would detract from Harry's story, but adding a single sentence to validate it wouldn't because uh, Percy Weasley's um, relationship with uh, Penelope, mm -hmm. Penelope mm -hmm. Clearwater. Clearwater is not really anything that furthers the plot, but it's there. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in here, and we'll talk about it. There's a whole lot of stuff in here, totally irrelevant to the plot. Why? Life! Yeah. It's life! How, how much of the events of your life are quote unquote relevant to the overall meaning of your life to this point? 2%. Yeah, I mean, you, you probably go, hmm, this class is pretty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of those are little Those are little things that Tolkien refers to as the atmosphere of a story. Those little details, okay? Those are the things that give it the air of realism. And there's a, there's a lot of that in here, okay? I mean, there's, there's, for example, there's a detail she throws in in every book, every book about Snape that leads to, if you were to trace this all the way, it could lead you to think Snape's a vampire. <laughs> yeah. In one of the, in, in um, Prince of Azkaban, Lupin has one of his spells, and so Snape's teaching defense against the dark arts. And Snape has them write an essay on werewolves. Lupin comes back, and what does he have them write an essay on? Vampires. Vampires. And we get, we get Snape. In fact, in this book, Quirrell's going to say, yeah, you thought it would be Snape, didn't you? There he is like an overgrown bat hanging around all the time. And when he finally leaves Hogwarts in book seven, how does he do it? He jumps out a window and flies. Not on a broom. Okay. I mean, have you seen him in the movies? And, it, he, <laughs> <laughs> and it's what? In logic, that's called a red herring. And is merely designed to throw you off the scent. She doesn't want you to really know. Because in one of these interviews, she also said, if somebody figures out what I'm doing, I'll stop. She wouldn't complete the series. That is, if somebody, before this book came out, figured out what was going to happen at the end, she, she wouldn't have finished it. Okay? Yeah, I mean, okay, so. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Why is it Harry Potter? What is the Sorcerer's Stone? In the real world, in our world, not in make believe fantasy land. Nope, in our world. Nope, there is none. No, it's not. Not a sorcerer's stone. No, a philosopher's stone. That's a philosopher's stone. A philosopher's stone 
is something real in our history of ideas. It goes back 3,000 years. This idea that there is this thing that you could use to turn base metal into gold and that you could use to create an elixir that if you drink it and kept drinking it, it would allow you to live forever. See, you have to keep drinking. It's not just, you know, one little sip and, right? So, and there are still people today searching for it, okay? I've got a big, thick book in, in my house called something like The Search for the Philosopher's Stone. And it goes back, it starts with two places, China and Egypt, in about 1,500 BC, all the way up to today, okay? So that's a real thing in terms of our history of ideas and such. What the hell is a so sorcerer's stone? Or as Neville calls it, a sorceress. Mixing phosphorus with, you know, it's, it's nothing. So why did it get the title Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone in the American edition? Because you cannot find this in Britain. Uh, no, it was the American publisher, Arthur A. Levine, who was the first publisher before Scholastic. They wanted a date in the market, or who they wanted to? Uh, no, good guess. You're really close. He said American parents are not going to buy a book for their children that has the word philosopher in the title. Why? Because American children are too stupid. <laughs> American children and American parents are too stupid. Okay? Which is also why I could show you this edition, American edition, and I could bring in the British paperback edition, and you would see much less white space in the gutters and margins. And you would see the words closer together, and the lines closer together. More words on a page. It's kind of like, we're so stupid, we need to have our words spaced out so that we can go closer at scabbers. No. That was the editor's, American publisher's decision. Okay? He also changed in the first few, it stopped as the books went along, changed a lot of the Britishisms, the English things, you know, crisps got changed to chips. Um, uh, cellophane tape got changed to scotch tape, things like that, okay? So it opens The Boy Who Lived, and I'm not going to say much about it other than what happens at the end of the chapter when McGonagall and Dumbledore show up. And Hagrid brings Harry. What day is this? Harry's birthday. Uh, nope, not Harry's birthday. It's the day after. It's the day after what? The day after his parents were killed. It's November 1st, 1981. His parents were killed on Halloween. Okay. Harry was born uh, July 31st, 1980. It's J.K. Rowling's birthday, by the way. Not 1980, but July 31st. Okay. <clears throat> so it's November 1st. So this is Halloween, which is actually All Hallows. Sorry. Eve. And this is all Hallow's Day. Hallow, Hallow, final book, definitely Hallow. What's the other word for that? <laughs> you just learned something new, didn't you? All Saints Day. Okay? You're going to think I'm crazy, but by the end of all this, you're going to go, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I just did. <laughs> so, Dumbledore's going to leave a letter for Harry in McGonagall's life. You can't leave a letter. I mean, because page 13. 
Really, Dumbledore, you think you can explain all this in a letter? This Harry and the Dursleys, for the Dursleys now, and hopefully they'll give it to Harry later, these people will never understand him. He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. Okay, do we know why yet? All we know is that Voldemort tried to kill him and couldn't. And something happened to Voldemort, and Harry's there, and you know, it's got the zigzag. Harry Potter Day in the future. Well, in book four, book four, book five, book five, Harry's going to come out of a trial, and Lucius Malfoy is going to refer to him as, anybody know? Close. Patronus Potter. Patronus Potter. Why? Because Harry can produce a Patronus. He learns that in book three. We all know, I think, what a Patronus is. We'll talk about that more later. So, Patronus Potter, Patronus, from the Latin, what's another word for a patron? A saint, a protector, a deliverer, a guard, okay? Or you could say somebody writes checks to support your you know, particular thing. She says today will be known as Harry Potter Day. Well, it's already known as all Hallows Day or All Saints Day. Patronus Potter, book six, five and six. What do we find out about Harry at the very end of book five? No? About, I mean, yeah, but no, not actually not book five. What is he? What's on the prophecy? He's the chosen one. Okay. So, Dumbledore says, we're going to leave him here. So Harry gets left there. Ten years go by between that and the next chapter. Because Dudley's has a birthday, and Harry talks to Snape. We're going to skip all that. <clears throat> and just before Harry's birthday, what starts arriving at the house? Letters, Letters from no one. Title of the chapter. What kind of letters? How do letters normally arrive? Mm-hmm. Normally, our world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Post person, I'll be non sexist. I know I won't. Mailman comes, puts a letter in your mailbox. That's it. What happens here? They get a letter in the mailbox. But there's one for Harry. Okay? Has Harry ever gotten a letter before? No, he's not. Why? Shut up, Siri. <laughs> because he... Do they keep him locked up? I mean, is, is, is Harry, you know, misformed? And... A couple more years, he would have been sneaked over. You know, you know. He has no friends. He has no family other than the Dursleys. Okay? So nobody's going to... So he's like, I got a letter. Does he get to read it? No. The Dursleys get it. Their eyes get all big. They throw it away. What happens the next day? Just one? More come. What happens the next day? More. One day, how do they come? Through the chimney, through the windows. Those are easy. I can go to any house, drop a letter down the chimney. I can go to any house, open the window, slide. Any one of us can do that. What's the one that should make you realize we're not in Kansas anymore? Yeah. What do you feed chickens to make them deliver letters in eggs? <laughs> I mean, that's some serious animal husbandry going on there. That's you, You'd have your chair of animal husbandry at any university in the world if you could figure out how to do that. So... Somebody really wants to send a letter to Harry, and he doesn't know who it is. So finally, what does Uncle Vernon do? With the rest of the family, of course. Mm-hmm. They leave. Okay. Harry's still not sure why. And it gets so bad, when they arrive at that hotel, there's a hundred of them. All addressed to H. Potter, 
Railway Hotel or Cokeworth Hotel, whatever it is. So then what do they do? What's the last thing before Harry finally gets his letter? Where do they go? Yeah. Hut on the rock in the sea. So that when Hagrid delivers his letter, it's Mr. H. Potter, hut on the rock on the sea. Okay? <clears throat> when does he get it? Uh, Just after midnight on his birthday. Right? Keeper of the Keys. Chapter, whatever that is, four. 46, 47. So, page 49. And, and we're going to do this really quickly. Hagrid says to Harry, mentions, you know, keeper of the key at Hogwarts. You know all about Hogwarts, Harry? Uh, no. Sorry. Sorry. You never wonder where your parents were, learned all what? What does Harry know about his parents? They died in a car crash. Why? We don't really find out the why until book three. Three, thank you. I get them, they all blurge. Because Aunt Marge says, you know, you're probably drunk. Okay? So, Dud uh, not Dudley, Hagrid says, do you mean to tell me that this boy, this boy, knows nothing about anything here? He's like, you know, I'm not a complete moron. I do know some things. I can do math, you know. I know you about snakes. He said, yeah. He said, no, 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 I mean, your world, our world, my world, your parent. Harry's like, what? This is the world. What is Hagrid introducing right here? Two worlds. Two worlds. Are they two totally separate worlds? Do you have to get in a spaceship to go to the other one? Do you have to find some wonderful blue flower in the Himalayas to go to the other? No. It's here too. Okay. He says, Harry, you're famous. Fake okay. Describe. What kind of clothes is Harry wearing? Probably. We don't get the actual description, but probably. Right now. Dursley's over large hand me downs. Okay. Famous? <laughs> yeah. Wrong address, buddy. <laughs> it's over and tries to stop him. And Hagrid finally tells him, Harry, bottom of page 50, you're a wizard. And he's like, what? I'm a what? A wizard. And it's something good, and I'd say, once you've been trained up a bit, with a mom and dad like yours, what else would you be? So whoever this guy is, Hagrid, keeper of the keys, we don't know anything else other than that. Other than that, if he were to walk in this room, his head would be about the top of that transom. And his hands would be not quite the same size, but about that big. Because they're told we're told that his hands are the size of a dustbin lid. Trash can lid. Okay. Pretty big dude. <laughs> a wizard. And he's telling Harry things about his parents that Harry's never heard before. And he pulls out the thing and he gives it to Harry and Harry reads, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Did any of you get a letter from Hogwarts on your 11th birthday? I actually did for all four of my kids. Oh. A couple of them pretty pissed when they realized it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because my daughter, my eldest daughter, is going to be 27 this year. She started reading them. We read them to her, and then she started reading them when she was like five or six. And, you know, just, and yeah, for a while there, it was... Now, Katie, you do know this is not real. You know, yes, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, we see the argument, the going back and forth between Hagrid and the Dursleys. Hagrid uses the word Harry's never heard before, muggle. You know, J.K. Rowling was sued over that word because there was a book written about muggles in... 1970s, 1980s, and the author suggested that she stole, and UK court said, nope, not a chance. Um, it's not actually a, a odd or word that she created. It's the pronunciation of this street in London, Monkwell. 
It's pronounced Muggle. Shakespeare lived on this street in London. It's still there, by the way. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So we hear Petunia. Page 33, 53, sorry. Harry says, you knew? You knew I was a wizard? No! <laughs> no! Of course we knew. How could you not be my dreaded sister being what she was? And what happens? It's like 10 years of just pent up venom. I mean, she just lets rip. But, I'm assuming everybody in here, who has not read, like, the last three books? Anybody? Show of hands? Okay, I won't give away much. We learn from the last three books, she knew a lot longer than that. Okay, not only did she know, but Petunia was a little jealous that her sister got to go off to that school for free, so, you know. She got a letter just like that, disappeared off to that, that school, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Then she met that potter, and they left and got married and had you. And, and, you know, they were abnormal. Well, what describes the Dursleys? Opening page. They are perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They don't hold to anything, two words, strange or mysterious. Strange or mysterious. Hagrid says there's two worlds. That's kind of strange and mysterious, right? That's what most people would say is maybe normal. Okay? So, they keep arguing. Hagrid tells Harry, your parents, you know, were great wizards. They fought Voldemort. Has a hard time saying it. Harry doesn't know really what it means. And he killed him. Right? And he tried to kill you, but he couldn't for some reason. Talks about other people that Voldemort killed. Page 56. The McKinnons, the Bones, the Pruitts. All people that are going to come back up, be mentioned again in books five and following. Okay. Now, keep in mind, when she writes this, she hasn't written book five. She might have summoned the notes for book five and know that she's going to pick it up. Okay. So, talks a little bit more about what happened to Voldemort. What does Vernon say, you know, they've spent the last 10 years trying to do, essentially, with Harry? They knew he was a wizard, right, because of his parents. So, he said, nothing that a good beating wouldn't take care of, and they would try to beat the nonsense out of him. Now, does he mean literally beat? Well, with dirt, with Dudley, possibly. That is, it's clear Dudley has punched Harry a few times. What's the physical evidence? Broken glasses. Okay. We don't have any physical signs that... Doug, that Vernon or Petunia have physically beaten Harry. Neglect? Yes, we get a lot of talk about neglect. Okay? So, Hagrid curses Dudley, puts a pig's tail on him. And the next day, he and Harry go off to, let me get rid of all this stuff. He and Harry go off to, I'm going to keep that up there for just a second, um, the place to get Harry's stuff. Let's see here. What's that place called? Diagonally. Say it again fast. Diagonally. I heard a couple of you say it. Say it really fast. It sounds like what? Diagonally. Why? Can you find Diagon Alley straight on? Nope. What do you have to do? Well, first of all, you can't be like me, a muggle. You have to be a wizard or a witch. That's the only way you can find the entrance to the leaky cauldron. But what else? By making it diagonally and making it diagonally, 
Rolling is suggested. It's kind of like just slightly off. What? Oh. Our world. It's, it's like it's parallel, but slightly off. Okay? You know, Star Trek would say it's out of phase was the language they would use. It's like people, you know, being two seconds ahead. And if they're two seconds ahead, we wouldn't see them because their time is two seconds different than our time. But it, you might get those little echoes, okay? So it's diagonally two hours, as it were. So they go off to Diagon Alley and they get all hairy stuff. They meet a bunch of people. I'm gonna skip a lot of the people that they meet, that they meet simply for time's sake. Okay. But they do meet one of his professors, right? Which one? Quirrell. Quirrell. How does Quirrell act? Scared. Scared, nervous, like a bumbling fool. Okay. Mischievous. Mischievous, possibly. We see the inscription uh, over Gringotts. Enter stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure here, etc., etc. So that kind of, you know, don't want to do anything negative here. So Harry finds out when they go into Green God's what? He's rich. He's how rich? He's loaded. <laughs> He goes in there, and there's a pile of gold. Okay? I mean, trust fund baby rich. Okay? So, who else does he meet? He gets fitted for robes at Madame Malkin's, while Hagrid has to pop off to the pub to get something to settle his nerves. Okay? Who does he meet in Madame Malkin's? Draco Malfoy. Draco Malfoy. And what idea does Malfoy introduce from the wizarding perspective, but reintroduces kind of from the real world perspective? That is, the Dursleys already demonstrate this. Um, no. I mean, he's like Dudley, but it's, a, it's an idea. It's a practice in our world. Not all people are equal. What does he call Hagrid? Or what does he suggest about Hagrid? He's a savage. Why? He's the groundskeeper. They don't know anything about the half giant stuff. Okay? So, we hear Draco, page 77. Say, it's not that page. Page 78. Harry explains who Hagrid is. Oh, I've heard of him. Sort of a servant, isn't he? He's the gamekeeper, Harry says. Yes, exactly. I heard he's sort of savage, lives in a hut, burns it down every now and then. Harry, I think he's brilliant. Do you? Why is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead. Oh, sorry, but they were. What's the next word? Our kind. That automatically introduces what? Us, them. They were our kind. Harry. They were. Does Harry understand? He says, well, they were witch and wizard. Harry thinks that's what's meant by it. Is that all that's meant? Or is there more than that? If that's what you mean, I don't really, really don't think they should let the other sort in, do you? Well, what other sort? Does Hogwarts let anybody who's not a witch or wizard in? No, you have to be a witch or wizard. So what's meant? Your blood. Because who are we going to meet shortly whose parents were not Hermione Granger? Who, as we will hear till the end of the series, is top of her class. She aces everything. All right? They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to know our way. Some of them have never even heard of Hogwarts. Until they get the letter. Imagine. I think they should keep it in the old wizarding families. And before Harry can tell him his name, 
He's done. And he gets to leave. Okay? So, who next to briefly discuss? Ollivander. Okay? They go to Ollivander's shop. And Ollivander talks a little bit to Hagrid. Talks to Harry. He sees Harry. He violates all norms of personal space. I mean, he just comes right up to him. You know, touches the scar and says, page 83, 13 and a half inches. You, powerful. Keep this in mind. You. Okay? Powerful. Very powerful wand. Wrong hand. Well, if I know what the wand was going to do, you know. And then he sees Hagrid. So they try to strike, try to start finding. Ooh, I never noticed that before. Hold anywhere. I don't think we are. What Voldemort's dominant hand is? I don't think we're told. Harry makes a point of saying that he's right-handed, which could be significant. We'll talk about it later. So Harry's trying out wands and everything. Page 85. Curious, curious. Harry, what's curious? I remember every wand I've ever sold, every single one. The phoenix feather, whose tail feather is in your wand. You have another feather, just one other. The brother of this wand. It's the one that gave you that scar. So this you wand has a phoenix feather. Harry now has a wand that has a phoenix feather. And what are we told about Harry's wand? Let's see. Page 84. Holly. So you and Holly with Phoenix Feather, and you with Phoenix Feather. <clears throat> Anybody know anything about yew trees? They're really good for making bows, for bow and for archery. Okay? They're also poisons if you try to eat the uh, needles. They're evergreens. Okay? There is, however, one animal that can eat them. Deer. There's all kinds of things about stags eating them and not dying. What about hollies? Oh, no, it has something to probably do with snakes now. <laughs> no, not, nothing to do with snakes. Hollies are evergreens. Okay. Leaves kind of look like this. They're, they've got points. And then they have berries. So they're evergreen. That means they're evergreen. The leaves are always green. They don't turn brown. They don't fall off. Okay. And they get red berries when? During the winter, there's a Christmas carol called The Holly and the Ivy. It's a medieval, sorry, that's my mother in law spells it. Uh, it's a um, medieval Christmas carol from England. Holly is from the Middle Ages on was symbolic of Christ in English literature, English culture, etc. Why? It's Evergreen, that is, it never dies. It's got a crown of thorns, because of the thorns on the leaf. And it's got <coughs> red berries. Kind of similar to the story about the dogwood tree. The exact same thing. The dogwood flower has points on the end, and it's got um, red berries also. Okay. So these are the symbols that are going to represent Harry and uh, Voldemort, okay? We are not going to finish this in 15 minutes. But. So, journey from platform nine and three quarters, which, by the way, is an error. What do I mean that's an error? Where do they where do they go? What train station do they leave from? King's Cross. At King's Cross, 
when the book was published, you could not go to platform 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 9 would be like official of the platform. 9 would be, you know, trains on right here, you know, platform here, kind of platform here. But it didn't work that way. <clears throat> the time the book was published, 9 was outside and around the corner. And 10 wasn't next to it. So the only way you have 9 and 3 quarters, if 10 is somewhere nearby, it, it, it didn't physically work that way. Why? When she came up with this, she was actually thinking St. Pancras Station, which is literally right next door to King's Cross. And when you have King's Cross train station, huge, right across the street, and it's a little street, it's just a dumpy little street. Right next to it, you have St. Pancras Station. And St. Pancras Station has this beautiful, huge Victorian hotel built over it and such. Right? Well, St. Pancras sta Station takes you to a certain part of the country, Manchester, which is where she was coming from when she had the idea pop into her mind. King's Cross takes you to the east of the country and the northeast. Right? But she just never bothered to change it. Right? Because that's an error. You know? <laughs> Doesn't want to take that. Okay, go to the sorting hat. So we see the sorting hat when Harry gets in there. Harry gets to Hogwarts. We see the sorting hat sing a song. Kind of a silly song. Okay. But it does tell us some important stuff. Page 117. You may not think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. Now, just stop right there. For, what is the sorting hat telling us as readers? And bear in mind who her initial audience is. 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe 13 year olds. What is she just told? A 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old. Don't judge by appearance. That's, that's what? That's a little lesson. That's a little life lesson buried, embedded in the story. Well, Rowling does that all throughout. In fact, she's going to give a whole bunch of advice for parents. That advice essentially is going to be. Don't be like the Dursleys. Okay? And we're going to hear some of it come out of Dumbledore's mouth. Okay? So, you may not think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. All right? So it likes to rhyme. You can keep your bowlers black. A bowler is a kind of hat. Okay? Your top hat sleek and tall, for I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat, and I can cap them all. Cap literally means... At the top. So you could put on a whole bunch of hats, but I'm always going to be on top. There's nothing hidden in your head. The sorting hat can't see. Now that's kind of dodgy. <laughs> I, I don't know that I want the sorting hat to see something, you know. So try me on and I will tell you where you ought to be. You might belong in Gryffindor. Gryffindor. Or what? Dwell the brave at heart. Cool. Their daring nerve and chivalry. Oh, so we have to add more. Daring nerve chivalry. So, really, brave, daring, nerve, chivalry. What's the difference between daring nerve and brave? Are they mere synonyms? Nerve means what? Nerve is putting in action. Bravery. You can be brave, but it takes nerve to do what? To actually show it. Okay? What about chivalry? I mean, that's a dead word today. <laughs> Honor. Respect, loyalty. 
Yeah. But principles is non-committal. You can have bad principles as well as good principles. Chivalry is all good. Okay? It goes back to a to the medieval, what's called the chivalric code, the code of King Arthur, okay? That the Arthurian knights in the Arthurian stories swore every Pentecost. It's called the Pentecost Oath. And that was to defend the defenseless, help those who needed help, and then it kind of follows up with the stuff that Christ talks about in Matthew 25, about those who will go off into heaven as opposed to those who will go to hell. Those who feed the hungry, clothe the naked, help the poor, visit widows and orphans, visit those in prison. And he says in this parable, all these people are going to say, Lord, Lord, when did we do that to you? He said, you did these things unto me. When did we do that to you? He said, inasmuch as you visited someone in prison, you visited me. You gave someone a cold drink of water, you did it to me. You did this. You did. And others who go to hell are going to say, when did we not? And as much as you didn't, you didn't do it to me. Okay. So those positive things are what are embedded in that chivalric oath. All right. So those are Gryffinders. What is a Gryffinder? What's a Gryffin? It's a lion in the middle. It's a lion. Get ready to have your head blown. And an eagle. Why lion and eagle? What are lions and eagles in their respective animal groups? King of the beasts. King of the sky. Where does a lion live? Down on the ground. On the earth. Where does the eagle live? Up in the air. What's just been joined together? Heaven and earth. The griffin in medieval what are called bestiaries. These are books of symbolic images talking about these mythical creatures. The griffin, usually spelled with an O, in, was always a symbol of Christ. Why? God, man. And what is Harry going to be called later on in the series? The chosen one. What's the Hebrew for that? Messiah. I mean, people want to burn these books because of their anti-Christianity. No. Okay, go on a little bit. Or you might belong in Hufflepuff. Notice which one she puts next to Griffin. Because after this book, unless you're one of the weird people and you really want to be in Slytherin, okay, we'll just set that aside for a moment. What? What? School, what house do you really not want to be part of? Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff. Ravenclaw, the brands. Okay, I can see that. Most people don't want to be Hufflepuffs. Cedric's pretty awesome. Who wants to be Okay, Cedric's pretty awesome. But how are Hufflepuffs described? By pretty much everybody. All the Gryffindors describe them this way. They're what? You guys are too nice. You don't want to use the word. They're losers. Who gets put into Hufflepuff? The ones who don't fit anywhere else. The ones who don't get selected by Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, or Slytherin. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. Cedric could be a Gryffindor. I agree. I agree. I mean, we're going to talk about the houses again because we're going to hear the Sorting Hat sing again, and we're going to hear more about the differing founders. Okay. Because based on this book, and based upon the house Harry gets put in, what's the common belief about what's the house you should want to be in? <laughs> Gryffindor. Everybody should want to be a Gryffindor. It's the best. I don't think Rowling thinks that. I think Rowling thinks it's Hufflepuff. And we'll see when we get in later books. Okay, so Hufflepuffs. What are what are Hufflepuff characteristics? Just, loyal, what else? Patient, true. Patient and true. And unafraid of toil. 
which is a large way of, they're hard workers. Every one of these in Western culture is a virtue. Every one. Dairy, that can be borderline. Nerve, that can be borderline. Bravery, you betcha. Chivalry, yes. Okay. So, Hufflepuff. If you've a ready mind, wise old Ravenclaw, were those of wit and learning. Okay, so Ravenclaw. What's that mean to have a ready mind? Wit. Ready to absorb information. Is it ready to absorb information? Or is it someone who can think fast on their feet? No. Louder? Like that one. Yeah, it's that one. I, I don't care your politics. Don't care your politics at all. Uh, should I use this example? I'm trying to think if it's a good example or not. I need to think of a good example. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of the, I've got one person in mind. I'm trying to think of the, the opposite of someone who's not quick on their feet. Um. <laughs> I can't think of a good opposite, so I won't use that example. I won't think. Okay, or Slytherin. What describes Slytherin? These cunning folk use any means to achieve their ends. <clears throat> cunning can be positive, right? Mm -hmm. It can also not be positive. Depends on, it's used. Depends on how it's used. But how does the sorting head finish talking about Slytherins? They'll do what? Whatever it takes. It can also be good or bad. Can it? Whatever it takes to achieve your means, do the ends justify the means? That is, if your ends are noble, then you can do whatever it damn well takes to get there. Gandalf, Gandalf doesn't think so, because that's the exact argument Sarah Man made. Okay? And Tolkien obviously doesn't think so. Somebody, yeah, somebody might have. Okay? So we see people get sorted. We see Harry going to Gryffindor. We see Harry go to potions, and Snape is a what? Vampire. <laughs> Vampire. It's not what I was looking for. I thought somebody would say jackass, but you know. What you say? That's not cursing. It's a, you know, gray. You know. Um, midnight duel. I'm gonna skip. Halloween. The only important thing about the Halloween chapter is what? The troll in the dungeon. Troll in the dungeon, <laughs> which results in the friendship. Why? Because Ron earlier offended Hermione, right? Mm -hmm. That same morning. Talked about how she doesn't have any friends because she's a know-it-all, etc. Way, way to go, Ron, Mr. Subtlety. You know. Well, what does Hermione do? She Louder. She cries in the she cries in the bathroom. Is that it? That's what cements her friendship? Um, she defends them. She defends them. She lied. Louder. Uh, she lied. Two? Uh, professor. Which one? McGonagall. <laughs> Describe Hermione and McGonagall. Because I think there's pretty much, you know, teacher acolyte there. I mean, she looks at McGonagall like a goddess. What's her first name? Minerva. Minerva. Goddess of wisdom. Okay. She's like, yes, man. <laughs> and she lies through her teeth to her. And Harry Runner, like, way to go. You know, <laughs> save their bacon. Okay. Quidditch. Why does Harry get selected for the Quidditch team? McGonagall sees him do a crazy thing. Crazy dive on the broom? Why does Harry do the crazy dive on the broom? To get Neville's remember all from Draco. How did Draco get it? He didn't steal it. It was on the ground. He picked it up. That's not stealing. Do it all the time. There's a $5 bill. 
<coughs> Why did Harry go after Draco for taking the removal? Okay, he had no intention of giving it back. Draco was being kind of a dick with the Okay. <laughs> See, time's up. Okay, next one. Um, what was Harry showing? What Gryffindorian qualities? Nerd, 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 nerd. Not really bravery, because it's not for Tasty little white boy. Chivalry. Chivalry. He's defending Neville. Neville's not there to defend himself, right? Because he broke his arm. I mean, Neville can't defend himself. And Neville can never defend himself until later on. Yeah. We don't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, film wise, Neville was the most perfectly cast. Oh my god. Yes. What a 11 year old, <laughs> pudgy, pasty 11, you know, Neville. And then 17 year old Neville is like Chris Hemsworth. I mean, so all of us by storm, no one was. Meanwhile, Daniel Radcliffe, you know, still. <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe could have been, been Gollum. <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe was the Could have been Dobby. He'd be better than Dobby. Snake was pretty perfect, too. I will say this my, my daughter and wife got to meet Daniel Radcliffe. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Who are my parents? Why do I live with the Tursleys? You know, but then deeper questions, especially when we get to book seven. Really, really, well, I'll take that back. Book five, end of book five. And then they start, you know, because of something that happens at the end of book five that I don't want to talk about, okay? So, after Quidditch, now we're going to get bogged down. As if we haven't been, right? Pages 196, uh, no, take that back, not 196, 197. Um, Christmas comes. Chapter Mirror of Error said. And Harry gets what? Okay, besides, I mean, back up. He gets presents. He's surprised. What does this tell us? He's not used to getting Christmas presents. He even gets one from the Dursleys. Okay? But what else does he get? Who gives him presents? Specifically. Okay, let's back up. Page 200. Harry says, I've got presents. Ron, what'd you expect? Turnips? Harry picks up the top parcel. Top parcel tells us it reinforces multiple presents. That's why presents was in the plural and not singular. Wrapped in thick brown paper, scrawled across to Harry from Hagrid, a roughly cut wooden flute. Okay. Pause here for a moment. Anything in the book up until this point shown us that Hagrid had any interest in musical instrument making? That Hagrid did any woodworking at all? No. That Harry was interested in learning how to play a flute? No. So what is this? Foreshadowing. It's foreshadowing. It's a plot device. It's simply a plot device. It is only there to advance the plot. That's not great writing. Great writing, there's motivation, there's plausibility behind the plot device. That is, it would serve a larger purpose beyond, oh, there's a Cerberus is there guarding the entrance to hell and you got to get past the three-headed dog. Okay? Anyways, so what else? The next thing he opens, a note from his aunt and uncle. We received your message and closed your Christmas present. What message? Harry probably didn't send them a message. Dumbledore. Probably Dumbledore. Right? And taped to the note of the 50 pence piece. Ron's like, whoa, cool, you know. Muggle money. Okay? So Harry gives it to him. Who's next? Mrs. Weasley. Whom Harry met very briefly, right? Back, back at platform nine and three quarters. And Ron's like, oh, no, she made you a sweater. <laughs> he opens it up. Hand-knitted sweater in emerald green and a large box of fudge. Okay. Ron, she makes us a sweater every year. Mine's always maroon. She makes us a sweater. How many kids are there in the Weasley family? Seven. She makes one for each of them every year. That's a lot of knitting. What's this tell us? She's a good mother. She's a good mother. Because the implication is it's not, you know, uh, I don't know what it would be, Makio Sweatero, you know, and it's suddenly there, okay? Fakio Sweater, because Fakio's Latin. Never even says anything about them being itchy. Yeah, well, uh, they always wear something underneath, so. <laughs> Harry, that's really nice, trying the fudge, which was good. Next, chocolate frog cards from Hermione, and then there's one more. Harry opens it up. Ron goes, oh, I've heard of those. If that's what I think it is, they're really rare and really valuable. What is it? It's in the Bill's Billiard Club. <clears throat> really? Harry looks down, and he's gone. <laughs> I guess it is. There's a note. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. Use it well. What would the effect be without use it well? If it just said, your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. A very Merry Christmas to you. It's not an instruction. Bingo. Use it well means what? Have fun. It does what? 
It makes you invisible. You go to town. <laughs> yeah, You're in a big old thousand year old castle that you've not been in a lot of places in it. And now you can go anywhere. Use it well. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, great Christmas dinner and everything. Christmas evening, Harry's back in his room. He's holding the cloak. He's thinking, use it well. Well, what have they begun investigating? Nicholas Flamel. Why? Because Hagrid's had one too many, and he mentions Nicholas Flamel. Okay. Nicholas Flamel, by the way, real person, 16th century French alchemist. His wife's name was Perenelle. So they're totally real. And Roland just kind of drops them in, right? So, he goes off. <laughs> he puts on the, he goes off to the library. Goes into the restricted, restricted section, etc. Is nearly caught, runs out, goes into an empty classroom, pages 208 and 209. And in this room, he sees a big mirror, page 207. The mirror reaches to the ceiling. I haven't been in, I've been in a lot of castles. I haven't been in many castles that have low ceilings. So this is a big mirror. I mean, most of them are like this, 10 foot ceilings. Okay? And it has carved on it. Bottom of 207. Erised stra eru oit ube kavru oit anwosi. Which means... I show you not your face, but your heart's desire. Rewrite it in reverse. And that's all it says. I show you not your face, but your heart's desire. He looks. He looks in the mirror and does this because he's about to scream bloody murder. Why? He had seen not only himself, but a whole bunch of people behind him. But the room's empty. So he turns around. Make sure the room's empty. And he turns back. There he was, reflected in it. White, <laughs> scared looking. Not white because he's white, but sheet white because like, he's seen a ghost. And there reflected, there reflected behind him were at least 10 others. Okay, reflected means what? They've got to be back here, and he's seen their reflection in the mirror. Well, whose perspective are we being told this from? This is Harry's perspective. This is what Harry thinks. Okay? No, nobody there. Was he, in fact, in a room full of invisible people? And this mirror's trick was that it reflected them, invisible or not. What idea does Hagrid introduce to Harry back on hut on the rock on the sea? Two worlds. One seen, one not so seen, the magical world. Might this be introducing another two-world scenario. He looks in the mirror again. A woman standing right behind his reflection was smiling at him and waving. Notice he did not see that before. So he looks, he sees all the people, turns around, makes sure they're not there, looks again. Now we get a number, there's roughly 10, turns around to make sure, looks again, and now the woman right behind him is smiling and waving. Okay? He does this. What happens when he does this? Nobody there, right? If she was really there, he'd touch her. Their reflections were so close together, but he felt only air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair. And her eyes, 
Her eyes are just like mine, Harry thinks. Edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green, same shape. But then he noticed she was crying. Why is she not crying? What's happened between seeing her smiling and waving and now crying? Is it he realizes who she is? She realizes who he is. Is it that she realizes who he is? He knows, she, she knows, he knows she's not there. Close. Rephrase that. She, she knows, knows he sees her. When he does this, when he reaches back, because she's smiling and waving at him, the reaching back tells her he sees me. And then what happens? Where is this happening? Yeah. Okay. This is it. This is who, obviously. This is Mary's mom. This is his mother. This is Lily. Okay. The tall, thin, black haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. Notice this is all happening how? Through the reflection. Through the reflection in the mirror. Louder. Now, time. Time is passing. It, whatever this is in the mirror, time is passing kind of there too. That is, we are told, we get all these adverbs and verb tenses that indicate time. Okay? This is a progression. So, she starts crying. She when he initially recognizes, not recognizes, knows her as his mother, but recognizes her, kind of focuses and sees she's smiling and waving. And then he tries to touch her, and she starts crying. Then he sees the man standing next to her, put his arm around her. Why? He's trying to comfort her. He wears glasses, and his hair is very untidy, and it sticks up, just like Harry's. Mom? Dad, what's happened for the first time in his life? He remembers. Is he remembering? Is this all some kind of form of projection? It can't be projection, right? Because he's seeing, quote unquote, in real time, changes in their persona. Shut up. Okay. What, is, what does that mean? She goes from smiling to tears to being comforted. Where is this happening? Is it simply in the mirror? Or does the mirror possibly show something else? Yeah. What is the, it says on its inscription, I show you not your face but your heart's desire. So if we take that literally, this shows Harry's heart's desire. Is his heart's desire really to see his mother cry? How many of you have seen, let's assume for the moment, you have a good relationship with your parents? Do you want to see your parents cry? No! It's the worst thing in the world, except for maybe having a child die. It's horrible. Nobody would want to see that, especially an 11-year-old kid. So can that be his heart's desire? Okay, so all these people in the mirror, let's say they're all real, first of all. And let's say they're all his family because he sees other what? He sees other eyes. He sees other hair. He sees other knobbly knees. These are all ancestors. Where are they? They're dead, right? They're all dead. He's the only one alive. He's the last of the potters, right? Could be, could be part of his seeking. Is his heart's desire to be reunited with his family or to be with his family? You had a question? I was going to say, like, that's what it seems like. Based off that, that would mean that he would want to be to see his family. Like that. They're going to go, he's going to go back with Ron the next night, right? And then he's going to go back again. And Ron's going to say, we're going to look at it. Ron's going to say something. 
And Harry's going to say, like, well, that can't be because they're all dead. It's like, well, okay, so you're alive, and what's the natural progression? <laughs> At some point, you become unalive. <laughs> we all die, right? Unless you have an elixir of life, you know, which we'll talk about. So what does he do? He just stands there and looks at these people. I think, and I could be entirely wrong, and it could be because of my reading into it, but I don't think that's the case. I think this is rolling, giving us kind of a pre-lifting of the veil. The veil that we see in book five, that is a literal veil there that somebody falls through and disappears, okay? But it's the veil meaning that the use of the term to describe the separation between death and life. We're going to see it in book four, too. That is, we're going to see Lily and James in book four. And how are they going to speak to Harry? Dumbledore is going to call them echoes. Echoes tend to do what? 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 They don't repeat. <laughs> they don't repeat anything to Harry when he sees them in book four, okay? I saw a hand. Well, I mean, earlier you, I could have misheard. Um, you said that it, on the inscription on the mirror, didn't you say it reversed itself at the end? No, no, no. Okay. If you read it in reverse. Okay, that's where I was getting confused because uh, I know you, I, so I took that as it was written in reverse right after that, so I was like, it's a two-way mirror. That's where my thought, my thought process yeah, I, I, well, I think it's clear that it's a two-way mirror. And, and it's just, I don't think the people are in the mirror. I think the mirror, like mirrors do in other works of fantasy literature, think Lewis Carroll, Through the Looking Glass. We're going to see that image come up in the next book. Okay? Only there won't be a mirror that you go through to get into, you know, La La Land. It's a book, right? So he stands, stands there. He goes and tells Ron. The next night they go back. What does Ron say? It's not overshadowing all of the book. Yeah. Ron is a stud. I mean, captain of the Quidditch team, holding the house cup, all alone. He's tall. He's tall, he's probably handsome and up, you know, funny looking, you know. And Ron asks, page 211, do you think the mirror shows the future? Because he says, you know, I'm head boy and all this kind of stuff. How can it? All my family are dead. Harry's not the brightest bulb in the box. I mean, <laughs> even by the end of book seven, he's not the brightest bulb in the box. Okay? It, it, it takes him a while. It's a good thing he has Hermione to cheat from. <laughs> Ron, let me look at it more. Harry, you're only holding the Quidditch cup. What's interesting about that? I want to see my parents. And they hear a noise, and they leave. Harry goes back the next night. Right? And he thinks, I can stay here all night. Page 212. Except Dumbledore's there. Back again, Harry. I didn't see you. Dumbledore. Strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you. Strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you. What's nearsightedness? You can only see what's up close. Is Dumbledore saying, no, 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 I was here. I wasn't invisible. You just thought I was invisible. I'm not the droid you're looking for now. Is he playing mind tricks on Harry? Or was he invisible? So you, like hundreds before, and you have discovered the delights of the mirror of Erised. Erised, desire. I, I didn't know it was called that. But I expect you've realized by now what it does. So what does Dumbledore start doing with Harry? In front of the mirror. Teaching. Every instance Dumbledore has with Harry becomes a teaching moment. He's always trying to teach. Okay, So what's he teaching? How to use the mirror. Why? 
Oh, you know, just in case you should ever come around it again, you know, might be helpful. Dumbledore says, 2.13, it shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desire of our hearts. So it's Harry's deepest, most desperate desire of his heart to see his family, because if it is, sucks to be Harry, because he ain't gonna. Two, to be united with his family, because depending upon your theological beliefs, that could happen. Yeah, something weird happened with lights out there. When you die, or three, I don't know what the third one would be. He says, it gives us neither knowledge nor truth. So, he does tell Harry, if you ever run across it, you'll now be prepared. We get Nicholas Flamel, chapter, Norbert, which we're going to skip. The only reason Norbert's important is because a Norwegian Ridgeback comes up in a later book, Goblet of Fire. Forbidden Forest. Why do they go off into the Forbidden Forest? Detention. Detention. With? Ooh. Scary, right? If you're going to have detention with somebody at Hogwarts, who do you not want to do detention with? Hagrid. Hagrid, really? Man, I'd, That's not even That's I'd be jumping. I'd do something wrong just to get detention with Hagrid. I have the basic control of kill you, though. Yeah, that's true. It could be dangerous. But what a way to go, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be fun. But if Hagrid's, if Hagrid's with you, Snape is the one I wouldn't want to do detention with because he's a vindictive little SOB, okay? So they go into the Forbidden Forest, and, you know, Malfoy plays his little joke on Neville. So Hagrid has to rearrange the group so that it's Harry and Malfoy who go off. What do they see? They see something... Over a dead unicorn, right? We we know a unicorn's been injured because it's silver blood's all over. Would what you shut said? the <laughs> apple? Man, since Steve Jobs died, apple <laughs> <laughs> Later we find out it's coral. Um what does Harry do when they see this thing in the clearing? Anybody remember? Does Harry go? <laughs> Draco starts moving forward. What's Harry do? He puts his hand up and stops him. Why? Why? This is Draco, public enemy number one. I mean, it's just a natural reflex. Is it? For your enemy? Because whatever killed that unicorn has. has no power power power. Okay, I mean, it could be that. But it's his, he's his enemy. He's defending, right? When he does this, think later book, Patronus. He's protecting even Draco. Does he want Draco to die? Nope. Book seven. Does he want Draco to die? Nope. Okay. So, who rescues them? Before Hagrid gets there, Ferens, a uh, not a unicorn, a centaur. And what does Ferens, Ferens, what does Ferens do that so angers Bane? Quiz question. Let's him ride on his back. Let's him ride on his back like a common mule. You know. What else does Ferens tell him? Don't come back. Yeah, don't come back. At least without Hagrid. What else? Does he say that? The thing that's sucking that unicorn blood, that's Voldemort, by the way, you don't want to, you know. <laughs> he implies that there's something. What else does he imply? What do, yeah. Unicorn blood will do what? It'll give you a half-life. But what kind of half-life? He says, 258. Harry's like, well, who would want to do that? One who has nothing to lose and everything to gain would commit such a crime. The blood of unicorn will keep you alive, even if you are an inch from death, but a terrible price. You have slain something pure and defenseless to save yourself. You have a half-life, a cursed life. 
From the moment the blood touches your lips. Harry, who'd be that desperate, Mr. Unicorn? All right, Mr. Sindor. <laughs> if you're going to be cursed forever, death's better, isn't it? Now, notice Harry just said, some things are worth dying for. It's a pretty it, wise thing to say. At 11 years old. It's better to die than to live cursed forever. It is, unless all you need is something else that will allow you to live long enough. Dot, dot, dot. Connect the dots, Harry. Come on, connect the dots. What is a not very well-held secret? Okay, what else? What's up at the castle right now? The Sorcerer's Stone is hidden up there. I mean, if the unicorns know about it, uh, centaurs, sorry. The ball's going to get them mixed up. So, Hagrid comes. Harry goes back up to his room. And what does he discover on his bed? There's the invisibility cloak that he left at the top of the astronomy tower when they tried to get rid of Norbert. Got rid of Norbert. He got caught. He left it there. Just in case. Like, should you ever need it again? You know, to go down and read the kitchen or whatever. So they go through the trap door. I've actually done both books in one night before. Um, skip a bunch. Harry says, Snape's after it. Page 270. He says, I've got to get through. I've got to find it, etc. Ron, 270. You're mad. Hermione, you can't. After what McGonagall and Snape said, you'll be expelled. Notice what's all important, Hermione. You'll get kicked out of school. Harry, he says something that's very interesting. So be because he alludes to, and I think at least, he alludes to an offer that's been made, maybe, but I don't think it has been. So what? Don't you understand? If Snape gets hold of the stone, Voldemort's coming back. He said the word, Voldemort. We haven't talked about that at all. What's Voldemort mean? Wonder. Comes from volare, Latin for fly. Fly or flee. The D-E means from, mort, Death. To fly or flee from death. Okay? He's coming back. Haven't you heard what it was like when he was trying to take over? Has Harry? Has Harry read Hogwarts of History? Has Harry read any history? No. He doesn't read. Pretty clear in the remaining books. Okay? He'll flatten it, turn it into a school for the dark arts, losing points, doesn't matter anymore, can't you see? Do you think he'll leave you and your families alone if Gryffindor wins the House Cup? If I get caught before I get to the stone, well, I'll have to go back to the Dursleys and wait for Voldemort to find me there. It's only dying a bit later than I would have, because I'm never going over to the dark side. How do, two questions. One, how does Harry know that Voldemort is still looking for him? He knows Voldemort tried to kill him when he was a baby. He doesn't know why. He doesn't know if he's still trying. Okay? That's one question. Who ever said anything about Harry going over to the dark side? That's so Star Wars-y. Yeah. The, closest, the closest to that you get is when Malfoy and Crabbe and Goyle come into their carriage on the train. And what does Malfoy say? He offers, he offers his friendship. I can help you there. I can help you choose the right people. And Harry says, thanks very much. I think I can choose on my own. You know, <laughs> you know it's Ron's gangly, you know, self standing there. And fat, pudgy Neville, you know. I'm going through the trap door tonight. Nothing you two say is going to stop me. Voldemort killed my parents, remember? Hermione, you're right here. We'll go with you. Okay. So, they have to get through the trap door. The trap door is guarded. How's it guarded? 
Fluffy. Okay, so number one, Fluffy, giant three-headed dog. How do you get past Fluffy? Flute. Flute. Music. Music to soothe the savage beast. Two. The next challenge is Devil Snare. Devil Snare. Q book five. That's Hagrid. This is who? Sprout. Okay. Three. The keys. Keys. Flitwick. Okay. Four. Chess. Nope. Uh, troll. Quirrell. It's already knocked out. Remember? Five. Chess. Nope. McGonagall. Let's stop there for a moment. What has to happen for Harry to get across the board? Ron sacrifices. Ron does what? He sacrifices himself. He says it's the only way. Sometimes you have to do this. And Did Ron think that he was going to die? I always wondered that. We don't know. This, this, you know, it's not a little chessboard. It's life-size chess pieces. And if you saw the film, when the queen comes to take him, what does she do? Queen or bishop? Wham! And she really knocks him. Okay. So this is strategy, right? This is brute strength. This is charms. This is what? I mean, I know it's herbology. Quick thinking. Okay. Music, I guess. <laughs> Big beast. Potions. Snake. Snake. But what is it really? Logic. It's logic. I mean, you know, I'll let the hell drink a lot of you. <laughs> it's logic, okay? And notice who gets them through logic? Because if that were Harry, <laughs> it'd be one volume in the Harry Potter. Okay? So, we get through there and. Hermione tells Harry, just before he drinks, uh, yeah, drinks at page 287. She throws her arms around him, and Harry's like, Hermione, you're a great wizard, you know. I'm not as good as you, he says. Me, books and cleverness. There are more important things, friendship and bravery. Be careful. Harry, you drink first. Yeah, what does that kind of apply because if she's wrong, you know. Not the, cho the chosen one. Kind of right. <laughs> so he goes through the man with two faces. And he thought it would be Snape. Why? What did he think Snape was doing at the Quidditch match? Cursing, Cursing him. him. Cursing him. What do we find out? Doing the opposite. Snape was doing the exact opposite. Severus. Coral left. Yeah, Severus does seem to be <laughs> so useful. To have him swooping around like an overgrown bat, you know. So they talk for a bit. Harry can't believe Snape was trying to save him. Page 290, 291. Yeah. 290, 291. Quirrell says, my master's with me wherever I go. Harry's kind of like, okay. I met him when I traveled around the world, top of 291. A foolish young man I was then. Full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. Right? He says, I was full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. And then what does he say? There is no good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. His ridiculous ideas is that good and evil even exist. According to Quirrell, Voldemort's moral system is there is no moral system at all. There is no good and evil. There is no right and wrong. There is no justice. There is no injustice. There's only what? Power. Do you know who else taught this? Lenin. 
Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. That's at the heart of Lenin's thought. Which is why when Lenin instituted his version of communism in Russia, Soviet Union, it's why he instituted the reign of terror. A reign of terror like the world has never... Hitler had nothing compared to Lenin. Hitler rounded up Jews. Why? Because they were imperfect, he thought. Lenin rounded up anyone and everyone for no reason other than to instill terror, to make people full of terror so that they always knew they could be the next one. Even the people doing rounding up would be rounded up next. Millions died because he said power was everything. All right? There is only power in those too weak to seek it. So Voldemort, obviously, is one of the strong ones. This ties into the guy I've mentioned in here before, Friedrich, I can never remember how to spell his name, Nietzsche, and his idea of the Ubermensch. The overman, or as we are more familiar with him, the Superman, not the guy in tights. <laughs> the person who rises above everyday ordinary morality and says, because I'm not everyday and ordinary, I can do what I will. What I will, what I desire. I have a will to power, a desire to take power in, you know, control and such. So that's what motivates Voldemort, at least partially. Okay? So... Harry sees the mirror and he starts to think, let's see, what is it I want more than anything in the world? Mom and dad go away, you know. There it is. And he figures out how to work the stone, how to work the mirror, and he gets it. Okay? Skip a bit. Harry wakes up. Where and when? Hospital. Where in the hospital? Hospital wing in the infirmary. When? Three days later. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> Where was he before? Where was he when he was talking to Quirrell? In the ground. Remember when they went through the trap door and they fell? You know, they kind of got down on their butts, slid down, got their arms up here, and then dropped. And then they looked up. How big was the trap door from when they landed? Postage stamp. That's a long fall. Okay, so they were deep underground, and then they came back up. Joseph Campbell would just go crazy with this. I mean, it's the mono myth kind of a thing. Okay, <coughs> so Harry's lying there in the hospital wing because he's come back from you know the dead, so to speak. Toilet seats piled next to him, and food and stuff. And what's the first thing he sees? Look page 296, not ticket right, 295. He wakes up. Very first thing, something gold was glinting just above him. Why gold? Why not silver? Why not black? Gold is pure. Gold is thought generally to be the most precious metal. It's not. Platinums. Find platinum, man. You got your life made. Find a platinum mine. Okay? And Harry thinks, the snitch. Close. Book seven. He tried to catch it. That is, he reaches up. He blinks. It wasn't the snitch. It's a pair of glasses. How strange. He blinks again. The smiling face of Albus Dumbledore. Without going in, without saying anything, this is going to happen again. In book seven, only there, Harry's not going to have glasses on, <laughs> and he's going to see perfectly. We'll talk about why. So, Dumbledore. And they start to talk, and Harry's like, but the stone, Dumbledore's, okay, so I can see, I can't distract you. Okay, so what do you want to know? 
And Harry says, you know, I thought I might, um, let's see. Arrived just in time, page 297, to pull Quirrell off you. It was you. How is that different from the film? What does Harry do to Quirrell in the film? He keeps touching him. And what happens to Quirrell? He just turns into dust. Right? Not the same. Harry, I couldn't, I, you know, I, I couldn't have kept off the stone. But not the stone. Boy, you. Harry thinks what's important is the stone's been saved. It's been destroyed. But your friend, Nicholas Flamel, listen to what Dumbledore says. You did do the thing properly, didn't you? Did, do, didn't. He uses that do verb three times. Why? Emphasis. What's he emphasizing? I knew you were going to. I knew it. I knew you were going to go after it. And you did it right. How did he do it right? You did some research. Way to go, Harry. <laughs> yeah, read a book. Tried to steal a book from the library. Well, that's new. well, Nicholas and I have had a little chat. It's all for the best. Harry's like, wait, wait, wait. They'll die, won't they? Yeah, they got enough to set their affairs in order. How old are they, by the way? 665, I believe. They die in their 666th year. Yeah, that drove the lack of Christians completely, you know, eight, you know what, crazy, okay? Okay, he immediately made them into the mark of the beast and everything. So, Dumbledore smiles, Harry's amazed. To one as young as you, he says, I'm sure it seems incredible, but to Nicholas and Perinelle, it really is like going to bed after a very, very long day. And we've talked before about, you know, what it's like to stay awake for 24, 48, 72 hours and such. Well, that's kind of what it was like for them. But now Dumbledore says, kind of theme or moral for this book. And each book that Dumbledore is in has one of these short, pithy statements that sums up the whole gist. After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. So, according to Dumbledore, Voldemort doesn't have a well-organized mind, does he? Because he fears death. To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. And then he says this about the stone. The stone was really not such a wonderful thing. So the stone equals as much money and life, or wealth and life, as you could want. The two things most human beings would choose above all, wealth and life, two things most would choose. Okay? Trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worst for them. By saying, these are the two things most would choose. And then saying, humans have a knack for choosing precisely. Precisely means exactly. The things that are worst for them, what's Dumbledore saying? Is he saying, Money and life are the worst things you could search for or you could want? On the surface level, yes, he is. Soften it. Go down on the, from the surface level a little bit. Think of you know, all the other symbolism we talked about relating to Harry's name and such, relating to Gryffindor, relating to his wand, Etc. What might Dumbledore be suggesting? So if these are the two worst, what would the opposite of these be? Because if these are the two worst things, then the opposite would be the best things. Poverty and death. 
any of you know the Bible very well? New Testament, Gospels, Sayings of Jesus. He who would seek to save his life must lose his life for my sake. And then he says to the rich young ruler, go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. Well, come and follow me means what? Deny yourself. Is this what rolling is, is, is rolling, burying this kind of Christian subtext in? I don't think so. What I'm suggesting, however, is that she is putting these clues. Now, there's a guy, and I disagree with him entirely. He's, a, he's an orthodox like I am, and he's written a few books about Harry Potter. You can find him on the internet called The Hogwarts Professor. He's done lectures, he's written a couple books. Um, you know, he, he approaches reading these books like there's a hidden key. Guess who found the key? He did. And wrote the hidden key to Harry Potter. Okay? Sold a lot of copies, etc. But he reads the book as code. He reads the books as code. I don't think they're code. I don't think that's how real authors write at all. Because it's crazy to write in code. Yeah. Largely, largely. Or just that J.K. Rowling is like a thousand times smarter than she actually is. Is that how he thinks? Not to say she's Definite, no. Definite, no, I know. Definitely the first, and I think some of the second, because he started to apply some of the same approach to her detective fiction novels. And saying that the detective fiction novels are kind of a continuation of the Harry Potter novels, but in our world. Well, it just kind of seems to me that if you were, if you think that this book is a written code, yeah, I, you're I, kind of saying like, there could be an author who wrote a book that every little thing it, they've expounded everything you've said, all the Latin and all the connotations and all of the things. It just would take. Well, you've read the back of the Declaration of Independence, right? Yeah. I mean, you sprinkle the lemon juice on it. Well, you have to apply with the Q-tip. Yeah. So. Yeah. Can you have that hand to all this? Put it on the hands on Yeah, I mean. I just think it's interesting that he would, he would, I'm not saying J.K. Rowling wouldn't be that smart. It's just an interesting comment no, it, to say no, that and she I, is that smart. And that I think, an book and I mean, I don't think I'm making this up. And I don't think I'm pulling it out of entirely, let's say, out of my background, seeing it. I think by Dumbledore, by Dumbledore saying, if these are the worst two things you can choose, okay, then the best two things would be the opposite of those. Okay? And if that's, if that's this, he's not saying, so Harry, you and your friends should go join the Hemlock Society and go find some Hemlock, go give away everything that you have, open up your vault in Gringotts and, you know, off yourselves. That's not the point. But I think based on Dumbledore's character that we see in the books, how much emphasis does Dumbledore put on stuff, on things? He doesn't care about his stuff, right? Book five, Harry starts trashing his office. He's like, have at it, man. Yeah, I've got too much of this stuff. People keep giving, you know, that's why he wants wool socks for Christmas. One good, okay? He does, he's not attached to things, okay? And I think this implies what? Material. Keep going. Attachment to stuff in life. This is, this is who? Ultimately, this is Voldemort. This is, you have enough of this to do what? To make sure this goes on. Okay? And Dumbledore, I think, is kind of suggesting you need to let go of those things. Okay? Yes? You can also say that with Lowe, and I mean, I guess it's the one why you have to make that one. You can say that with? With Lowe and that uh, you have more power. Oh, yeah! Yeah, I mean, definitely. Okay. So, is Harry, is Harry, I mean, Harry's convinced then? 
He's like, cool, I get it now. I'm 11 years old. I understand this deep philosophy. No. He's like, Whoosh. I don't have a clue what you're talking about, you crazy old man. So he kind of changes the direction. He says, um, he's going to try other ways of coming back, right? I mean, I haven't killed him. Dumbledore says, no, no, Harry, he's, he's not gone. And, you know, somebody else might help bring him back. And if he's delayed again and again, why, he may never return to power. Harry's like, okay, other things. Things I want to know the truth about. Ooh, the truth. He says, it's a beautiful and terrible thing. should therefore be treated with great caution. I won't lie to you. Yeah, it's a lie. <laughs> he does lie to him. <laughs> if he lie, what's probably true? Well, we'll see. Harry, why would he want to kill me in the first place? Pretty direct question. What's Voldemort have against me? I cannot tell you. Not today. See, literally, that's a lie. Cannot means he is unable to. He is able to. He chooses not to. He doesn't say, Harry... You're too young. I know you just fought him off and defeated him, but you're still too young. We're going to have to wait till you're a little bit older. I don't know, until you fight him off and defend him, defeat him, you know, at least two or three more times. Wait till you're 13. Uh, wait till you're 15. Okay. So, when you're ready, you will know. Well, when we get to that spot in that book, that later book, Dumbledore kind of admits, yeah, that's a damn fool, I should have told you then. You, you were ready then. So Harry asks, okay, what about Quirrell? Why couldn't Quirrell touch me? And we get the touchy-feely stuff, literally touchy-feely stuff. Your mother died to save you. If there's one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. Why can't Voldemort understand love? J.K. Rowling, in an interview, told us why she thinks he can't understand love. And if she literally means this, it is one of the most despicable ideas in human history, in my opinion. Okay? She said Voldemort could not understand love because he was the product of a love potion. He was not conceived in love. Think about that for a moment. That would mean what in our world? Anyone, anyone who is the product of a rape, incest, and frankly, how many bazillions of one night stands that are not love? That's just pure raunchy sex, you know? Or lust. Um, that is a vile idea. If if that's what she really thinks. Or if she's applying it to a larger world. Yeah. She could just be literally meaning he's a child of a love potion specifically, and that is why he's and, not loving. And she could, but things don't yeah, things take, don't exist in a vacuum. They, I mean, they exist within. The larger world. Yeah. Judah? Well, I don't want to go too much into the way this books, but just thinking about what we know in this book, one reason he might not understand love so well is because he's cursed. He lives a cursed life. Okay. We at least know he lives a half-life because he subsists. Yeah, I mean, he, he drinks the unicorn blood, so that... He still loves the point that I know, like even as a kid. Well, we will see in a later book, there's going to be talk about this. I mean, there's going to be a debate between Dumbledore and Voldemort. And Voldemort's going to say the old argument again. I had never seen, you know, anything in the world that shows me that your kind of power, love, is greater than my kind of power. We'll talk about that quite a bit when we, when we get there, about, you know, what is Voldemort experienced of love and such. Okay? So Dumbledore tells him about the... Um, Invisibility cloak, and we can pretty much stop there. 20 minutes. Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> Jump to the end. No. Um, 
<laughs> so here he's got a birthday coming up, and he doesn't get any presents. And the night of the big dinner comes at the Dursleys. Vernon's trying to get a big deal. And who shows up in Harry's room? God. Okay. <laughs> Dobby the house elf. And he explains to Harry. He explains to Harry. That pages 14 and 15. He's a slave. Life's not good. Harry asks him, bottom 14, why don't you leave? Escape. How self must be set free. Harry, and I thought it'd be bad staying here for another four weeks. This makes the Dursley sound almost human. Can't anyone help you? Can't I? What does Harry immediately do? When he learns of Dobby's life situation, he wants to help. He does that every time with everybody who meets who is suffering, even in the slightest. He always reaches out. He empathizes. Okay? And Dobby, you know, bursts into tears and goes banging himself against the stuff. Dobby says, page 15, Dobby has heard of your greatness, sir, but of your goodness. Here he's like, I'm not Hermione. I mean, she's a Harry Potter's humble and modest. So good, humble, modest. He says, you don't talk about your victory over Voldemort, etc., etc. Okay? Dobby goes on. I heard that you defeated the Dark Lord again recently. Harry's like, yeah, I don't know. Page 16. Harry Potter is valiant and bold. So, good, humble, modest, valiant, bold. No, we need you to stay alive, Harry. Harry Potter must stay where he's safe. He's too great, too good to lose. He must not put himself in peril. And Harry gets in trouble. Okay? Notice he gets in trouble for something he doesn't do. Okay? And the Weasley brothers come and rescue him. I'm going to skip a bunch. And Harry goes off to live for the rest of the summer at the burrow with the Weasleys. Describe the Weasley house. It's a home. What does that mean? It's infused with love. Love's what keeps this rickety old, rickety old building, you know, still sitting, standing. Okay. Um. So he gets pretty much everything going great for him there, because Mrs. Weasley doesn't blame him. She blames Fred and George and Ron. They get ready for the school year. They go back to they go to Diagon Alley and they go to Flourish and Blot. Okay, now who have we been verbally introduced to, but we haven't yet met? That is, we've heard talk about this character. That they will meet at Flourish and Blot. Gilderoy Lockhart. Describe Gilderoy Lockhart. Perfectly cast, by the way, in the film. Um, Kenneth Branagh nailed it. Extremely arrogant. Arrogant. Is arrogant really the right word? No, self-consumed. Narcissist. He is the person. He is the person for whom the word was made. He is in love with himself. Okay. Because to be arrogant, what do you really have to have? You got to have something that it's built upon. He doesn't, right? I mean, what do we learn about him? Everything he said he did. He stole from somebody else. He didn't do any of it. Okay? So what happens at Flourish and Blot? How does the fight break out? And why does the fight break out? Lucius Malfoy and Arthur Weasley. Okay? We hear Draco, you know, say something about the Weasleys and Ron's, you know. Because the that they yeah, I mean, he talks about, you know, he looks at Jenny's copy of Transfer, Transfiguration Book, and says, this is all your father can afford you, and throws it back in her cauldron. That, by the way, is when he puts Tom Riddle's diary in Jenny's possession. Okay? And what, what does Arthur do? 
Let me rephrase this. Why does Mrs. Weasley get upset? What are children told in schools today, up through universities, about the proper way to resolve a conflict? Fisticuffs. It's not fisticuffs. Conflict is never resolved in violence. What an utter load of BS. Think World War II. World War One. Any war. Any war. <laughs> well, any war, but a lot of wars are stupidly started and such. World War Two. I mean, the United States was kind of that one at least, dry kicking and screaming. Okay, Vietnam. No, that was the French. The French started that one. The French should have gotten out of it. Okay, Korea eh, kind of snookered into there. Civil War. Okay, it took what? There had to be violence. Why? The one side had to be stopped. Period. And it wasn't going to happen through, yeah. through the UN, you know, or through words and such. So I'm not saying Arthur's white right, but Arthur, you know, he does what? It's Arthur who attacks Lucius. Because what did Lucius do? He attacked Arthur's honor, essentially. Is Arthur rich? No. Are the Weasleys rich? No, they're not. Why aren't they? Yeah, they have kids. Is that it? Yeah, I know people with seven kids who are wealthy beyond your imagination. When I, when I lived in Orlando, I taught at a, at a um, school associated with a church down there, and one of the kids there, his father was the general manager for the Orlando Heat. I mean, they were buku millions. They had like 15 kids. Like five or six of them were their own, and the rest were all adopted. They had the money. They had the price. Right? Is it because Arthur does what he wants to do? Yes. Because Arthur doesn't care about money. Okay, he's a little weird. <laughs> he cares about, you know, muggles, muggles <laughs> and electrical boxes. <laughs> And light switches and such. So he's kind of defending his honor. Mrs. Weasley, you know, busts the gasket. So Hagrid has to come in and break it up. So Hagrid does. And I'm going to... Page 63. I know, I'm skipping a lot, you know. Where does Harry land via the flu powder when he goes to... He doesn't show up at Diagon Alley. He goes to Nocturne. Nocturne. K-N-O-C-K, but it's also what? N-O-C-T-U-R-N-E, Latin for night. It's where all the dark stuff is. So, Hagrid breaks it up, page 63. Well, 62, just before the fight. Dear me, what's the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard if they don't even pay you, pay you well for it? What did Lucius just tell us? I'll be a disgrace if you want. Pay me. Pay me well enough. That's what he is. <laughs> okay. Arthur, we have a very different idea of what disgrace is the name of wizard. Clearly. Company, you keep Weasley, and I thought your family could sink no lower as he looks at Hermione and her parents. And I said, Arthur, just, you know, and Fred and George, get him that, you know. <laughs> so Hagrid breaks it up. You should have ignored him, Arthur. Rotten to the core. The whole family. Everyone. What does rotten to the core mean? No. Fundamentally evil. Fundamentally evil. No redeeming qualities. Hillary Clinton's deplorables and irredeemables. Okay? Irredeemable literally means what? Cannot be redeemed. Cannot be redeemed. Okay? That's what Hagrid is saying about the Malfoys. Bear in mind, look at the Malfoys' name. Anybody know what it means? Bad foie. It comes from French. Malfoy, bad faith. It doesn't mean don't put your faith in them. It means they have bad faith. Where do they put their faith? 
of Voldy, Lord Voldemort, okay? So, rotten to the core, everyone knows that, no Malfoy's worth listening to, bad blood. So they're rotten to the core, and they're bad blood. Where have we had this idea introduced earlier, first book, but not in these words? Not to this extent. No? Muggles? Diff exactly. But now we have this coming out of Hagrid's mouth. We like Hagrid, don't we? We're supposed to kind of identify with Hagrid. He's one of the good guys. And yet, what does it show us? Even the good guys can be wrong. Because this is exactly, use the word again? Prejudice. This is prejudice. So what's Rowling doing? Okay. Think audience. This is more teaching. She's trying to teach her young readers there are kinds of ideas you shouldn't hold to. Okay? We don't know that yet. Here we're told, bad blood rot to the core. What's going to be said about Hagrid in book four? Bad blood. Why? Half giant, rotten to the core. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I just would say that I don't agree with that. Okay. Which? About the quote, the bad blood thing. I don't okay. necessarily agree with the assessment that She's trying to show that, like, Hagrid makes a mistake, too. Because I just, it could be, I could be wrong in the way that I read it. I just, that's not the way I read it when I, okay. and I noticed it before you read it, that I was like, ah, oh, it has, says bad blood, too. But I always read it as the fact that Hagrid, who is never in the books, even shed in the light of being, he's even an innocent character to the point of being dumb sometimes, because he's so innocent, hmm. that he would say bad blood, based on his, because Hagrid is the one character in the book who is shown to represent the peer no matter what race they are, no matter what kind they are. Yeah, later on, like hippogriffs. later yeah. on, yeah, we're going to hear Hagrid, not in this book, in book four, there's going to be a big conversation that they're going to have with Hagrid mm -hmm. about his background and such where he's going to say things that kind of make this passage stand off in stark relief, because they don't seem to so be the my, same. So my thought is that when Malfoy says, you don't, you know, what's your last name? Right. You want to make sure you get it with right. the right blood. He is asking for a physical name, a place of birth. When, when yeah, not Hagrid, in a place of birth, but physical name. He wants to know if yeah. you're one of the old wizard pure when blood Hagrid, When Hagrid says bad blood, he is referencing a character, a trait of character. The Malfoys are bad blood because they're evil. They're not bad blood because they're the Malfoys. Okay. Oh, I, say rotten to the core. Yeah, I see your point. I see your point. I, I, I don't mean bad blood literal. Yeah. Like the blood is bad. Cool, it's, yeah. it, it is the character trait. Mm -hmm. But he's using... The imagery of bloodline mm -hmm. by using that term bad blood. By saying there's bad blood, there's also saying there's good blood. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because he is quote unquote innocent or not as well educated and he can't verbalize it in a different fashion. Yeah, what I meant it's just kind of like it's like like maybe he meant less of a as he was saying, and I don't know for sure, less of like a physical bloodline as like a me and Dumbledore and the teachers at Hogwarts, we're the good blood, not because of our family lines, because we're just not horrible yeah, and I don't, evil. I don't think he means family line at all. Yeah. I, I don't think he means, you know, that they're bad blood because of who they're descended from. I don't think he means that at all. Yes? I disagree with both of you. Well, he says no Malfoys, plural, meaning the entire Malfoy family. No, it's not plural. It's possessive. No Malfoy apostrophe is. It's no pal. It's it's not possessive. No. It's a contraction. No Malfoy is worth listening to her. It's just a contraction. Okay. But no Malfoy is worth. But even there, yeah, no Malfoy is worth listening Malfoy to. Malfoy can still be. Yeah, sure. So 
And I think he, I think he means that. He think all. I think Hagrid is saying all Malfoys are evil. Period. There. Later on. Well. This was the irredeemable. Yeah, to 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 some extent. Okay. But when he says that, they're not list. They're not worth listening to. They're rotten to the core. And then he summarizes it. And he summarizes it with the bad blood. That's what it is. Why is that important? What's going to happen? Ne the very next book, the very same idea is introduced very early on. By whom? Aunt Marge. No, She's going to talk about bad blood in breeding, and then she immediately takes bad blood in breeding dogs, English bulldogs, to humans and apply that to Harry. In fact, she's going to say, you know, when the bitch is bad, the pup will be bad. And Harry's ears start to ring because he's like, she just called my mother a bitch. And that's when it starts. I mean, that's when Harry starts to, you know, lose his control there. All right. So they leave flourishing blots in the next few minutes left, is the Whomping Willow. Why the Whomping Willow? How did Harry and Ron get there? Flying, flying, car. flying for England. Why aren't they on the train? Because they can't get through. We don't know immediately that it's because of Dobby, but it turns out it's because of Dobby. What do we know about the Whomping Willow? It's a, it's a willow tree. It likes to hit you if you come too close to it. I don't know if you've ever been around a willow tree in a big windstorm, but you know, the branches swing or it's kind of what it's like. This one, however, <laughs> apparently has a mind of its own, you know. We find out more about it later on. So they get up to the school, and what do they think is going to happen? I think they're going to get expelled, but Dumbledore. Says no. Bottom of seventy-seven. They look in the room in the uh, great hall, and they see Snape's not sitting where he should be sitting. They start to fantasize. You know, maybe he's dead. Maybe he's been fired. And Snape says, or maybe he's just wondering why you weren't there. At the, okay. And we see an example of on page where is it? Yeah, eighty-two. We see an example of Harry's wit. It's one of the few examples we see of Harry's wit. McGonagall's talking about punishment. Because, I mean, they damaged the Whomping Willow. They didn't arrive how they're supposed to arrive. And Harry cuts her off, which is odd in and of itself because you don't cut off McGonagall. And he cuts her off and says, essentially, we shouldn't have points taken away from Gryffindor because when we got in trouble, that was before term actually began, right? Bottom 82. McGonagall gave him a piercing look, but he was sure she had almost smiled. Why? She said good point. You're learning, boy. <laughs> that, was, that, that was a smart... You can be taught, yeah. You know? <laughs> Maybe. That was a smart move on his part. Okay. So no points, but what does happen? No points taken away from Gryffindor. But what does happen? They get detention. Harry with Lockhart. Lockhart and Ron shining, polishing silver. Okay. Uh, we get the chapter with Lockhart. It's just there to show what? He's a bumbling fool. Okay. Dimwit. The next chapter. Mudbloods and murmurs. What's meant when Malfoy calls Hermione a mudblood? Louder? It's definitely a slur. Uh, means she doesn't have wizard parents, or it's meaning it's how one of the he's better than she has muggle parents. She has muggle parents. Her parents are muggles. It's not that one's a muggle and one's it's both parents are muggles, okay? Rowling does not 
invent this term. This term was in use in the early 20th century in the United States. It's not native to England. It's akin today, and I use the word nigger even when I have African American students, it's akin today to nigger. Right? The KKK used it to describe the race that rose up from the mud. They called blacks mud people early on. Right? Dense. That's how offensive it really is. So that's why when Malfoy calls Hermione that, what did Ron do? And notice it's Ron. It's not Harry. It's, it's not Fred and George. I mean, they get involved in a fight. But it's Ron who goes after Malfoy. Why? There's already something going on <laughs> between them. Or, or Ron has something for... Hermione that he can't verbalize yet, okay? But he curses him with his wand backwards, foreshadowing, okay, because that's going to happen later, and he ends up, you know, puking up slugs and stuff, okay? So they have that conversation with Hagrid, which... Yeah, we'll probably pick up. Let's see. We'll pick up around 115 next week. In somehow <laughs> try to finish it in Prisoner of Azkaban. Oh, 